First, we're gonna talk about uh, the agenda today. We're gonna cover on how to apply for, to, for, federal, for federal student aid. We'll cover information as it pertains to comparing financial aid offers, what to understand about the Parent PLUS loan, and to increase our engagement with you all, we will engage in the knowledge check to check your knowledge of the, of the information and topics covered. But first up, let's talk about applying for federal student aid. Well, who, we are, who are we here at Federal Student Aid, also known again as FSA? Well, we are the, we're the office that ministers uh, the, the free application for federal student aid and over 114 billion in grants, work study funds, as well as student loans. These loans help students pay for college, career school, and trade schools every year. One thing to note about the free application for federal student aid is that it is a form that must be applied every single year. It must be completed every single year. We do have resources on studentaid.gov that is composed, developed just for you, the parent. Now students, as they're completing the FAFSA form, they, these uh, the sources of aid can come from institutional, state, and as well as us, the federal government. We do have videos covering on information on what is a FAFSA, why you should complete it. We had sessions just yesterday that was conducted and hosted by none other than our great colleague, Tanika Mangum. You can check out those videos on our YouTube channel at FSA Outreach. Please check, take the time to check those out. We also have a video that will be uploaded in 24 hours from, the, from this session on how to complete the 24-25 FAFSA form as a dependent student. So if you would like to know information on how to help get guided through completing the FAFSA form as a dependent student, please check out our session on that as well. So when you're completing the FAFSA form itself, if it, the FAFSA form itself is also a, a new role-based experience for all contributors. A contributor is someone who is adding information to the FAFSA form and is required to do so. That may be the student, that may be parent one and or parent two. Everyone would have a separate role on the form itself. Once everyone has provided their information onto the FAFSA form, then the FAFSA form will be complete and good for processing to be sent down to the colleges, universities, and or career schools that were indicated on the FAFSA form. When you're looking at who's a contributor and who's a parent, we first define the parent as the biological or legally adopted parent of the student that is completing the form. These guidelines are set by Congress and are outlined in the Higher Education Act of 1965. For students who are considered to be dependent students, they will need information from either one parent or both parents, depending upon three factors. Number one, dependency status, marital status, and tax filing status. So when identifying who's a contributor or who's the parent to be completing the form, these are things that should be taken into account. We have provided a QR code on the lower right-hand side of your screen if you wanna learn more about this particular topic and the role as you as the parent. Now you heard me say contributor. Again, this is a new term uh, for the 2024-2025 FAFSA form. And because it's a new term, let's talk a little bit more about it. You heard me also say on the previous slide that the contributor is someone who's required to provide information for onto the FAFSA form. Upon doing so, they have to also provide consent and approval for the federal tax information to potentially transfer onto the form, but most importantly, for the student to be considered for federal financial aid. If you wanna learn more about, are you considered a contributor on your child's FAFSA form? Please feel free to check out the video at the QR code, I scan in the QR code on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side of your screen. When it comes to completing the FAFSA, all contributors must have an FSA ID. So you can visit studentaid.gov or you can go or you can Google FSA of creating a FSA uh, ID and you can get started on creating an account today. You don't have to wait, but keep this in mind. 
every parent that is considered a required contributor must have their separate FSA ID. So the student needs to have one, the parent one needs to have one, and the parent two needs to have one. This is gonna serve as your electronic signature when it comes to signing the FAFSA form at the end, after you get through with completing all previous sections. Now, if you are a participating as a contributor and you do not have a social security number, you still can create an FSA ID. We do have guidance to help walk you through that process as part of our video on how I create a student aid gov account if I don't have a social security number. If you wanna check out that video, please feel free to scan the QR code on the lower right hand side of your screen. Now, when it comes to preparing to complete the FAFSA form, the first thing that you should take into account is gathering your items, gathering things such as your students and yours social security number if you have one or an A number if you are an eligible non-citizen. The information that you provide on the FAFSA form must match what's in what's with the Social Security Administration. If you're married, then you need to provide your spouse's name, their date of birth, their social security number, as well as their email address as well. It's good also to have handy your 2022 tax returns because when you're completing the 24-25 FAFSA, we do operate on a, or look for your, your, your prior, prior prior year tax returns, which is like two years ago from the time you're completing. A simple way of thinking about that is when you're looking at 2024 and we say prior prior year, you just minus two years from that and that is the tax year that we're looking for. So if you're completing the 2023 24 FAFSA form for the first time, then we will need 2021 tax information. So knowing the right tax year to be that will be uh, applicable to your, your uh, FAFSA year that you're applying to will be very helpful to you as you're navigating this process. Now, you may need additional information such as your W-2s, any records of money earned, and uh, additional information as well, uh, tax related. So make sure you have that handy as well. Now, if you also have a copy of the, of the total child support that you receive for that uh, applicable year, then you wanna make sure that you have that handy as well. And a good practice is to have any bank statements or any information as to your liabilities, because we do ask you for the net worth of your investments, the net worth of your real estate and your businesses. So you wanna make sure you have your appraisal value of your real estate minus any liabilities and then your liabilities will be able to have that documentation so you can accurately place those values into those fields. And the same thing with your business, if you have a business valuation and minus your liabilities as well, the finding out what the network that net worth of that is, then that will be very helpful to you to accurately place that into the field when we ask for it. So keep that in mind as well. Now, when it comes to starting the FAFSA form, there are two ways you, that the FAFSA form can be started. Number one, it can be with the student. The student can start it on their own, on their own behalf, or the parent, where the parent can start the FAFSA form on their own behalf. When I refer to this, I'm speaking about the 24-25 FAFSA form. Because both parties can start the form for one another, it's always good practice to have the student start the FAFSA form. And when they do so, make sure that they're actually pasting their name as is aligned with Social Security Administration onto the FAFSA form itself. So to avoid any nicknames, avoid any spaces, any dots, any numbers that are in the name but are not listed on the Social Security, NAR, Social Security card, it's always good practice. Now, when it comes to inviting a contributor, make sure that they have also the name that when a parent went in and, they, and you guys signed up for your FSA ID, it should be the, what they put into the invitation should be the exact same that is aligned with how you signed up for your FSA ID. So your name, your date of birth, your social security number, as well as your email address, all should match 100%. So you can get invited and you can receive that email and then you can start contributing to your students FAFSA form. When it comes to accessing the FAFSA form, there are a couple things that you need to know. You will get an email saying that you've been invited to contribute to the student's FAFSA form, and then you'll follow the prompts from there. If you don't receive an email of that contributor invitation, you can go to studentaid.gov, 
log in. Once you log in, you're going to scroll down on your dashboard and you'll see on the left hand side where you have been invited. You want to make sure you're following those instructions, whether you get the email or you're looking at your dashboard. You want to navigate through the process and then you want to provide consent and approval to make sure all of the information from your federal tax information is transferring onto the FAFSA form. You also want to input the information as it relates to the additional financial questions, and then you want to make sure you sign as well. Now, once you do so, you do your part, you'll close out that part. If you don't have to invite an additional contributor, you will be all done. Now, also keep this in mind. We are aware of an issue preventing required contributors without a social security number from starting or accessing the 2425 FAFSA form. Well, until it's resolved, a student, if the student meets uh, they must meet the FAFSA deadline or they must meet a deadline set by the state higher education authority or an institution, then we encourage you to follow the steps that we outline on studentaid.gov within our recent announcement. Keep this in mind that after their form is processed, contributors who don't have a social security number must return to the form at a later date to provide consent and approval to share their information and to add their signature. This will allow us to access the IRS exchange data and calculate the student's SAI. An SAI is also known as the Student Aid Index. It is simply an index number that is used to determine a student's eligibility for the federal, state, or institutional financial aid programs and, and their need. So when, it, when, when, the, when you go in and you're looking at providing consent and approval, I think you heard about me say this a couple times now about providing a consent and approval and also the consequences if you do not provide consent and approval. Keep this in mind that it's, again, simply allowing us to transfer the federal tax information onto the FAFSA form for the contributor. If anyone declines the consent and approval, then they must provide the information manually and the student would not be eligible for federal financial aid. Also understand that declining this approval will prevent the Department of Ed from requesting the federal tax information, also known as FTI. So when you hear those terms, that's what that means from the IRS. And just keep this in mind that this information is used for completing the FAFSA form. And we want to make sure that the student is putting themselves in the best position to be eligible for federal, state, and institutional funding. So all of these steps are required in order for a student to achieve that. And when it comes to completing the, the parent section, they, they, you'll, when you go into the FAFSA form, you'll be asked to provide information in terms of your parent demographic and your parent financial during those particular sections of your student's FAFSA form. Now, when it's transferred in, into the FAFSA form, you don't have to worry about going line by line, as many of you recall back in the past, where you had to go line by line, enter information directly from either your, your tax returns. You don't have to experience that this year. Well, when once information has been successfully populated onto the FAFSA form, then we move on to asking you those additional questions, particularly around benefits and things like that. Uh, when it comes to family size, it should be the same as the number of individuals that are reported on your tax returns. So you want to make if you, if you see that number different, then you want to update the FAFSA with that correct number. Now, the, another another change that occurred for the 24-25 FAFSA year, that the number of college won't impact the calculation of the SAI. Again, that's just student aid index calculation. OK, so but we're still asking you the question, so please enter the value as accurately as possible. We will also ask you information for the amount of child, uh, child support received for that particular student, as well as asset amounts. Going back to the going back to the statements about the net worth. How much do you have in your, your, your checking your savings and cash on the day of completing that application, among other additional questions as well. So please note for those as well. Now, when it comes to signing the FAFSA form itself, you must have an FSA ID to electronically sign. So you want to make sure you have that FSA ID prior to completing the FAFSA form because that's going to be your way to access and sign the FAFSA form to be able to make sure that that, that form can be fully processed by the Department of Education and then sent down to the institutions that were set forth by the student when they went through adding up to those 20 colleges, universities, and career schools, they'll be able to do so. And once they once we process that information, it will be sent down, but we can't do that without your signature. So it's important that you are able to uh, 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 attain an FSA ID and then have and then sign the FAFSA form and be, so the student can have that fully processed as well. 
Now, after it's been processed, keep in mind that we'll begin processing on the first half of March. So it's very important for students to have to really populate that FAFSA form with as many colleges, universities, and career schools they possibly can, up to 20, because when a, when a form is in, pro is being in process of being processed, then the student can't make any changes until it's been fully processed. That's when they can add additional schools. So if they're completing it for the first time right now, they want to make sure they're adding as many schools as they possibly can, because again, we're not processing those information, those facets until the first half of March. Now, when it comes to understanding that timeline when schools will be able to provide an offer letter, we'll get into that, or excuse me, a financial aid offer, which we'll get into in the subsequent uh, slides. Keep this in mind. Every school is different. It's always best practice to be in communication with the schools that the student is very interested in. Um, after the form has been submitted, you and, the, and your student will receive a confirmation email, and the student can also log into studentaid.gov to check the status of their form as well. So keep in mind as it relates to just timelines and when you should expect to hear something, it's going to vary institution to institution. Now, you've gone through the process of creating an FSA ID. You've gone through the process of completing the 24-25 FAFSA form. Now I know you must be wondering, okay, what's next? Well, typically what happens is that since the information is, is pushed down into the colleges, universities, and career schools, they then take the information that we provide them and, and, and look to see and evaluate the student for institutional and or if they're eligible for any state aid as well. On these offers, they're going to list the varying financial aid programs a student may be eligible for. It can list grants. It may list scholarships as well as any federal financial aid loans or federal student loans that a student may be eligible for. Now, keep in mind there are additional steps as it relates to federal student loans. So if a student may, one of them must make sure that they're understanding what they're borrowing and what necessary steps that they have to undertake to, un to accept those loans and have those loans dispersed into the account on their behalf. Any offers that are created specifically for the student that are coming from the institution are from the institution and based again on, on the information that the student, that the institution has for that student. So if they're missing information, then you wanna make sure that you're communicating with the institution's financial aid office to make sure they have the necessary information to give a more accurate financial aid offer. Now when, now, when you first receive the offer, it is not binding. So you're not obligated to do anything unless it's, unless it's expressed by the college, university, or career school's financial aid department. So if you want to learn more information about that, the best practice is communicate with the financial aid office at the college, university, or career school about what are the next steps after receiving that financial aid offer letter. Now, an important note here is that the, there is something called FERPA. FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. This is all protects the privacy of student education records. This applies to all schools that receive funds under applicable program of the United States Department of Education. Keep this in mind that FERPA gives parents certain rights with respects to their students' educations, educational records, and it transfers to the student once the student reaches the ages of 18 and beyond that high school level. Now, schools have a written permission, must have a written permission from parents from the parent or eligible students in order to release information, which basically means just because you pay the bill doesn't necessarily mean you can get access to those educational or financial records. There needs to be something on file. Each school has a different practice as it pertains to their FERPA process. You need to contact that school to determine what is their process regarding FERPA. If you do not, if you do not obtain the right to get, gain access to the student's records, whether it's the educational records or the financial records, then the school cannot release that information to you. Even though you provide them a check, even though you may provide them cash, even, even though you may provide them payment on the student's account. And that's very important to note, especially when you're experience, you may experience that when you go forth and you're trying to just see what the bill is, the amount of the bill, and you are denied because there was no FERPA record, uh, FERPA release record, on file for you as the parent. So keep that in mind uh, whenever you're engaging with the colleges, universities, and or career schools. Now, when it comes to comparing 
financial aid offers and understanding what those net costs are, the first thing that you should understand is what is your what is your cost of attendance? That's the amount that is going to cost the student to go to school. Now, if they're attending school at least half time, then the, Q, the, 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 the cost of attendance is going to be the estimate of books, materials, supplies, equipment, the housing, the food, also known as board, room and board in that case. It's also your transportation expenses, the loan fees, miscellaneous expenses. So all of these are, 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 are part of the formula that makes up the cost of attendance. Typically, students can't receive more scholarship, more fun, financial aid than that max cost of attendance. So every school has an individual set of or set, a set number for their cost of attendance. And if you're wondering what that is from one school to another, then you want to make sure you check out their website to find out what their cost of attendance for that school. Keep in mind things that impact cost of attendance, your enrollment status, whether you're going full time, half time, a part time, all of that may vary your cost of attendance um, at that particular school as well. Now, when you comes to understanding what that bill may be, that's broken out in terms of your tuition and fees as part of that cost of attendance. It's not your total cost of attendance. You're only factoring in what's on the bill. And typically what's on the bill is your tuition and fees, your room and board. And so you take all the scholarships and grants that the student may be eligible for, minus the tuition, fees, but, uh, 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 room and board. Once you, once you minus those, then I will give you the estimated net balance of what may be due. But also, remember we brought in the concept of cost of attendance. There are other varying costs like books and supplies that the student and yourselves need to consider and be prepared for because those may cost a, a, a fee, they may cost a, a, something at the college or if you're obtaining it from an external uh, entity. So keep those in mind as well and is relating to understanding what you're receiving and what, and what those net costs are. Now, if the student decided to take out any type of federal student loan, such as a subsidized loan or an unsubsidized loan, then those may help pay for their college education and pay things towards the bill. The difference between the subsidized loan and the unsubsidized loan outside of the, of, of the amounts, the max amounts that the student can borrow is that the subsidized loan does not accrue interest once the funds are dispersed. OK, now when, when, what that means is when it's when funds are dispersed into the student's account at the college, university or career school, then what happens is that the, on, on an unsubsidized loan, that's when the, the interest starts to accrue or starts to build on a subsidized loan. It doesn't build at that point. It builds when they're when after their grace period, typically when they're required to pay, typically when they're when they're six months after graduation or they start stop going to the institution. So. Keep these things in mind when it relates to when it relates to the differences between subsidized and unsub. These are going to be in a student's name. These the student is going to be responsible for paying things. These 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 items these are loans back, but they can be factored in to help pay for the student's educational expenses, such as those tuition fees, room and board, but those other expenses like books and supplies and transportation expenses and things like that. So they become very helpful. Uh, when, when helping a student uh, uh, afford a college education. So I know I covered a lot, so let's check your knowledge for just a moment. I want you to get out a pen and paper and all, you, all I want you to do is going to write down A, B and C and let's see if you're able to get it right. Don't worry, we're not we're not going to publicly show what your responses are because you're going to write it down on a piece of paper, a piece of napkin or just keep it in your mind. So we're going to meet Tammy. Tammy's son David will be starting his second year at a community college in the fall. David has been identified as a dependent student and Tammy has been identified as the parent contributor on David's FAFSA form. Tammy did not file federal tax return, a federal tax return for 2022. That's the scenario. The question is, what should Tammy do when she participates on David's FAFSA form? A, well, Tammy should complete the parent demographic section and sign the form only because she didn't file taxes in 2022. She doesn't need to complete the, the parent financial section or provide consent or approval. That's A. Now, or is it B? Tammy should complete all parent sections of the form, provide uh, consent and approval and sign the form. Hmm, that sounds good. Or C. 
Tammy information should, is, will not be needed on Davis FAFSA form because she didn't file taxes in 2022. So, drum roll pre, please. The answer is B. Even though Tammy did not file a tax return for 2022, her information, consent and approval, and signature are still required on the form. And so she's required to go in and complete the form as necessary, completing all fields. So the right answer is B. So if you got it right, pat yourself on the shoulder, pat yourself on the back, and give yourself a round of applause. All right. Now we're going to move into the next session, next section about understanding parent plus loans. You heard me in the, in the first half of our session talk about the subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And that you heard me also say that those are in the student's name. But here I wanted to introduce to you, if you do not know what it is, the Parent PLUS loan. This is a Parent PLUS loan that the, that the, a loan that the parents can take on the behalf of the student. So in order to be eligible, you must be a biological or adoptive, legally adoptive parent. OK, it goes back to our definition as set forth by Congress and guided by the Higher Education Act of 1965. Now, you can't have adverse financial uh, uh, credit history unless you are meeting some additional requirements and you must meet the general eligibility requirements as it pertains to federal financial aid. Now, keep this in mind, too. This is a loan that the parent is taking on the behalf of the student. The parent is responsible for the repayment of this loan. Whereas, whereas the student is only responsible for loans that are in their name. The Parent PLUS loan will be in the parent's name. Now, a couple things to note about the cost of a Parent PLUS loan, that the interest rate, the loans that are being dispersed now between July 1st, 2023 and June 30th of 2024 is at 8.05%. Now, they are unsubsidized. If you recall me, if you remember what I stated about that unsubsidized loan, how once it's dispersed, it's the interest starts to a build. That's also the word uh, term called accrue. Then the same thing is occurring with the Parent PLUS loan as well. There is a loan, a loan fee, and that's just a percentage of the loan amount and is deducted from each disbursement. Um, right now, that percentage is at 4.228%, okay? So when, when you're thinking about what are the cost of that loan on your screen is the cost of, of, of uh, borrowing a Parent PLUS loan as it pertains to this year, where the loan fee is also associated with last year as well. So keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to applying for the Parent PLUS loan, many schools use the Parent PLUS loan application, but if your school has a separate application process, you wanna make sure you're following that process. So the best practice is when you're discussing that financial aid offer, you're also discussing how to apply for that Parent PLUS loan because of the of that they may have a separate application process that you need to be made aware of as well. Now, all of the information that is on the application will be sent to the school that you select and the financial aid office is going to use that to determine the eligibility for the Parent PLUS loan. Now, it can change the, 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 the amount of that that you may be awarded can change because remember how I stated before, all of the aid must fit within the cost of attendance. It cannot exceed that cost of attendance. So you need to be uh, understand how much to borrow would be dependent upon how much room is within that cost of attendance. A good rule of thumb on a general high level will be if your cost, all cost of attendance is 10,000 and a student was awarded 5,000 in grants and scholarships and you say, I wanna take out that Parent PLUS loan for the remaining 5,000, then that will be the max that you can take out on the behalf of the student. So in order to do that, if you wanna increase that amount, then you need, they need to have a good reason to increase that cost of attendance. This is why the conversation always occurs, begins with the financial aid office. If you wanna access the Parent PLUS direct, the direct PEST loan application, please take out your phones and scan the QR code on the lower right-hand side of your slide of the screen. And I'll pause there for it, just in case you need to open up your cameras. OK. Now, after you submit, after you submit the direct plus loan application, the funds will be dispersed into this account at the school. The account is where all the funds, the scholarships, the grants, all of the funds that a student is, is, is taking out in terms of financial aid and applying to their account, they're all going to paying the bill. It's all going directly to the school. So the school may have a, a process where they disperse 
the the overages or also known as the refund to either the parent or the student but you must talk with the school's bursar office or the financial aid office or the right office at that college university or career school about the distribution of those additional funds because any overages and refunds may be paid out directly to the student as well you also must make sure you sign that MPN prior to that being able to be dispersed. An MPN is your master promissory note. That's your promise to pay. So, but you don't need to sign a new MPM for each new disbursement. So you may receive one or more under the same MPN for a period up to 10 years to pay toward your, your uh, student's educational uh, costs. So keep that in mind. If you look at the slide and you wouldn't take anything away from this slide, the most important thing is understanding the disbursement when does it disperse and how you want it to disperse. So just keep that in mind as it relates to after you submit your after you submit your approved direct plus loan application. Now, if you do have adverse credit um, and it was it was denied because of adverse credit history, we do we do have an appeal process. If you go to studentaid.gov under the loans and grants tab at the top, you'll see appeals a credit decision, and we do have a process for that. We do welcome you to go ahead and do so. You have to log in with your FSA ID if you want to submit any additional documentation and submit additional um, information in regard to the fields that are already grayed out. Uh, you log in and then follow the process from there, and then that you'll be on your way to appealing that particular credit decision. Now, when loan, when the funds are paid out, as I, as I stated, different schools have different schedules for paying out loans. So some may pay out within the first week of enrollment. Some may take a couple weeks, some may do further on in, in the semester or trimester, but with the first thing they're going to do is apply those funds to the bill. So if there's are any overages, if, is a, if there's a balance that are due, that's due, any overages of that point or are considered a refund will then be generated. If there's not a refund, if there's not an overage of funds that are due to the student uh, or yourself, if that was set up with the school, then that would just be with a zero balance with the school and then they'll be they'll proceed on with the account paid in full. So each school has a different process of when those funds are applied or dispersed into the account. You wanna make sure that you, communi you, you communicate with the financial aid office to determine those particular timelines because they're gonna be the ones that you speak with as it relates to how funds are paid out. When it comes down to repaying um, student loans, these loans can't be transferred back to the student because remember, the student has their own individual loans, the subsidized and unsubsidized loans, or their direct grad plus loans. That's their loans. Now, any parent plus loan is a loan that the parent is taking out and the parent can't transfer it back to the student. They're responsible for repayment of those particular loans. And so if you wish to have, if you wish to see if you qualify for a deferment, then you need to contact the loan servicer as it relates to the deferment process. But when it comes to repayment, you're the one who's going to be responsible for paying that back to the loan servicer. And as you get closer to the end of the deferment, if you qualify, then the, your loan servicer is also going to provide you additional updates as it pertains to your particular loan, as well as other helpful information along the way. Additional information as it pertains to the loan deferment, interest will still accrue. Now, your loan servicer will let you know when your first payment is due, but keep in mind that during the period of deferment, it doesn't mean that interest is suspended. It's still accruing while your loan is in deferment. So keep that in mind as it relates to the parent plus loan deferment. Um, there are repayment plans that are, are, that are around the parent plus loan. We have the standard, the graduated, and the extended repayment plans. Um, standard repayment plans are a fixed amount over the course of 10 years. Your graduated uh, repayment plan is where it starts low at first and it starts to build increase over time usually every like every two years and then the uh, the payments are calculated off of those 10 years and then your extended is where it is, it's extending the period the time period to repay from 10 years to 25 years but you got to have more yeah you, you have to have more than about 30,000 in outstanding direct loans to qualify for that a couple things to note about consolidating your 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 um your payment your direct plus loans, which you can do into a direct consolidation loan, then just keep this in mind that you have to be in that period between 10 to 30 repayment repayment period for the standard or the graduated. If you are in what's called an ICR, that's your income contingent repayment plan, that is generally assessed on 20% of your discretionary income over the course of 12 years of the fixed repayment plan of 12 years. So just keep those notes in mind and start to prepare for that. We do have a loan simulator 
If you go to studentaid.gov, uh, you scroll down on loan on the loan section of the site, you'll be able to also access the loan simulator to run different scenarios as it pertains to the different loan repayment pro programs that we do have available. So where are we at in, in the session right now? It is time to check the, your knowledge. So let's start out with, with scenario A. We're going to go ahead and meet Michael. Michael is planning to take out a direct plus loan for parents to help his daughter Anna pay for the cost to attend a state university. He has completed the online application, was informed by Anna School that he is eligible. The question is, Michael has completed the Parent PLUS loan process and does not need to take any additional steps. Is that true? Well, put a T for true, an F for false. Again, write it on your notepad, piece of napkin, or keep it in your head. The answer is false. Before Parent PLUS loans can be dispersed, Michael must first sign the MPN. And you see those acronyms. That is the Master Promissory Note. That's where he's agreeing to the terms of the, of, of the loan. So whenever you hear MPN, whatever you see MPN, MPN, that is the Master Promissory Note. It must be it must be signed before the loans can be dispersed. Now, another question: True or false? Michael must change the amount of his Direct Plus loan for parents at any time. To, to exceed the cost of attendance at Anna School. I'm gonna repeat that again. Michael can change the amount of his direct plus loan for parents at any time to exceed the cost of attendance at Anna School. Drum roll, please, please. Answer is false again. I hope I got you. If I didn't, you are, you are absolutely one of our scholars. Now, the reason why the answer is false because while the direct plus loan application can be used to change the amount of a direct plus loan they previously requested, the max amount cannot exceed the cost of attending at the school that the student will attend. So that's the key, that it cannot exceed that max. So even if, a, even if you get approval from the financial aid office to increase that cost of attendance, it still can't exceed that, whatever that new number is. So keep that in mind as it relates to it. So we're glad you joined us today. But we have a, a number of different resources that are available to you, starting out with studentaid.gov. As you heard me throughout this session, we have abundance of information and content on our studentaid.gov from students and parents and loans and so forth. We welcome you to we invite you to learn more about, about being a parent. We have a checklist. We have an abundance of information and resources for you as parents, to, and as well as if you're joining us as guardians, to be able to learn more about this particular process. We do have a, a website and resources dedicated to you at studentaid.gov slash resources slash prepare for college slash parents. I know that was a mouthful, but it's on your screen. We welcome you to come to studentaid.gov to learn more about the information. We also have information on our social media platforms, on our Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and X, formerly known as Twitter. So if you're a social media savvy, you, you enjoy looking at your feed, put us on your feed, allow us to provide to you updates as it pertains to the FAFSA, as well as also our federal student loan programs. As we, now, we also love to hear your feedback. Please provide us your feedback. We wanted to know how you're gonna use this information. Did you like this information? Leave us a comment, drop us, drop us a question. We would love to hear from you. So we're gonna hold this screen for just a second so it gives you an opportunity to either take a picture or take your cameras out and access the QR code, which will give you access to our feedback post-event survey. And we want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your schedule and your sacrificing your time to learn more about understanding federal financial aid. We hope this session was a, was helpful to you. And as we continuously build out content that's dedicated to you, the parent or guardian, we welcome you to engage with us, engage with our future webinars. Join us tomorrow as we're going to navigate through our two additional sessions around our webinar series for Better Future, Better FAFSA. And guess what? We're gonna have we're gonna have a session on completing the FAFSA form as an independent student, as well as more information as it pertains to our federal financial aid programs. So join us tomorrow. We'll be happy to see you there. Thank you and have a great one. This webinar has concluded.